Can I start? Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Before, uh, before we begin proceedings, I would like to acknowledge that I'm currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I also want to acknowledge the tradition of custodianship and law of the country and pay respects to those who have cared and continue to care for country. My name is Vivian Webb and I'm curator of public art at the University of Sydney. We are here to speak about the artwork by Judy Watson, Jugama, which was launched this morning here on campus in conjunction with the new Susan Wakel Health Building. The artwork consists of a dilly bag constructed of laser cut rolled and weathered steel within a setting of plants used by Aboriginal people for weaving and food. This conversation will last approximately 20, 25 minutes. I have a few questions or topics that I will direct to my guests, and then there will be time for questions from the audience. Uh, and if online, if people would like to put questions through to the chat, then we can also uh, address those. I would like to start by introducing my guests. Judy Watson is a Brisbane-based artist whose Aboriginal matrilineal family is from Wani country in Northwest Queensland. Her work is inspired by Aboriginal history and culture, revealing Indigenous histories through the process of working from sight and memory. She is exhibited widely, both within Australia and internationally, and currently has an exhibition presented at Artspace, Geelong Dumalara, with artist Carol McGregor, who is Wathurong Kulin Nation. My other guest is Professor Jacqueline Troy. Jacqueline is running a little late, so we're going to start without her, but I will give an introduction so that she can just join proceedings when she arrives. So Jacqueline Troy is Director of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Research here at the University of Sydney. Professor Troy is Aboriginal Australian and her community is Naragu of the Snowy Mountains in Southeastern Australia. Her research interests are currently focused on documenting, describing and reviving Indigenous languages, and she's the author of the Sydney language. Over the development of this artwork, I've been privileged to have numerous conversations with Judy, but also with Jacqueline. And um, I, this seemed a wonderful opportunity to bring these two esteemed individuals together. Um, Judy, I'm going to pass over to you now. My first question is, uh, could you please give an account of the conceptual development of this artwork? So, uh, well, doing uh, any artwork really for a public art. delve deep beneath the ground and look at how people are going to interact with the work and uh, what it's really talking about. So there were many things that came into this. You can see here images of this beautiful net, uh, you know, sort of bag, dilly bag, which I first saw in 2016 at the British Museum in an exhibition curated by Gay Skullgall, a Tasmanian Aboriginal a uh, woman who is a uh, curator at the British Museum. And it was uh, an exhibition called Enduring Civilization. Here you can see the beautiful fiber that's gone into this uh, net bag. And I was thinking about the fact that uh, where the public artwork is located, it will, it's near the Susan Wackel building. And thinking about the fact that uh, this is um, a place for research, healing, and thinking about Indigenous uh, technology innovation and the fact that um, Aboriginal women in many communities, including my own, would use their bags um, as receptacles for gathering uh, resources and also gathering healing plants and uh, working with them, as you would know. <laughs> yeah, um, and I... At the British Museum with that beautiful dilly bag, 
uh, the scientists had done a study of the fiber and identified it as being of the brachychitin Illawarra flame tree. But when Jacqueline gets here, it was quite interesting because uh, she was saying that she doesn't think that that's usually uh, the fiber that would be used. Um, now, the original beautiful dilly bag that you saw is very different to this one here because of the process of making it. And I wasn't um, choosing to actually replicate uh, the weave in, you know, substantial detail. And it's a different sort of process. Those people who might have seen uh, my work, which is Toro outside Quagoma, it's a very, very different process. And this case here, you can see it's almost like if you imagine a large 44 gallon drum, but basically it's rolled uh, steel, uh, which has been laser cut, looking at the sort of uh, weave and woven detail within uh, that dilly bag. And then um, there's all sorts of other things that come into it because you need to make sure that children or, you know, adults can't sort of get their hands or fingers stuck. You know, there's a, lots of things that uh, are part of the process when you're working in a public space. You can see the steel there at this stage and looking at the shadows. Um, and then it went through a weathering process where it uh, achieves that sort of the rust-like look to it. You can see a lot of people at Urban Art Projects that I work with. And I, um, a lot of the people I work with, I call them artisans because they're very, very good um, and very particular at what they're doing. This is the first time I uh, worked with this, you know, the sort of the Rio steel in terms of making the handle. And that was an interesting thing because actually in Aboriginal weaving and all across the world, you see a similar process where you would, um, you know, have the weaving and then sort of have it connected, um, almost like in this case, like a winching. And uh, in fact, I was just reading about that, uh, looking at our language, our one new language, and there was a word for um, the spindle, which is used to make this. And it's interesting because um, it's the same word, juru, uh, that my grandmother said was the, the word for penis. So I thought, well, interesting. <laughs> same <laughs> shape. <laughs> um, you know, and I think there's lots of words which connect, you know, across uh, intention and you know it might be something to do with sky or cloud or or whatever and you can see the connection all the way through um yeah so that's that's what I was sort of uh yeah. working with thanks Judy um now you you actually went and saw the bag uh the two dilly bags I believe at yes. the um at the British Museum yes and they were actually from this area exactly they, they uh i think there's only a few bags from this particular mm. region can you tell us what it was what it was like to actually get get up close to those bags and mm. and um i suppose how that you've in conversation with me you mentioned it this artwork is a in a sense a sort of reclamation of sorts yeah so i'm interested if you could expand on that those thoughts how that came to you yeah it was very moving to see um, those beautiful bags and also to look at the timing of it. You know, this is Port Jackson. This is back in, I can't remember the date. Was it 1790 or something like that? I think it was, yeah. Some, very, very early. Really early. And so it's, to me, it's like these, you know, these beautiful um, baskets, artworks, artifacts, cultural material have been taken. And in a way, it's like by thinking about where they've, come from I mean I did a whole series of the work called uh, the holes in the land thinking about when these beautiful um, material culture objects have been made you can imagine the fiber has been taken from people's hair in some cases or even from the you know the bark of the tree um, you know sort of through the twining process you know sort of whether it's um, you know rolled along the leg collecting DNA skin hair everything else and so it's carrying that and so I always think of the old people are within those beautiful bags uh or others oh here's from this yes, morning I haven't, the beautiful seen, smoking. I haven't seen this it was so moving so beautiful 
with uh, Les McLeod. This yeah. was the smoking ceremony that happened this morning and Judy hasn't seen these images. No. I just managed to no. grab them and drop them in before yeah. the talk. So that's why. Yeah, um, it's great. Yeah, there was, it was a very mm. moving it um, was, yeah. ceremony. So when you think of the old people within those, those bags being over there, and then I thought about the depression that gets left when something is taken from country and is over there. The old people are still there, have travelled on, you know, um, on a boat on that long journey. Uh, and then to get some of those objects and material culture and things back, mm. even if they do, don't come back, in terms of artists making work in response to it, I do feel like it's, it's like a, a cultural reclamation, mm. honouring them. But honestly, uh, seeing the original bags in, in the British Museum yeah. was absolutely so moving and to think that they still have the freshness it's like they could have been made yesterday um you know they're living breathing they're they're not dead at all no that's okay i think it's about 1790 something but i could be wrong uh Yes, I think it was about 1790. Yeah, which is mm -hmm. incredibly early. Mm. All, yeah, from Jackson. Yeah. And so that's why it just sort of seems like to, the fact that that is over here, we are here. Um, it's like trying to bring something of that back. But that's not the earliest one. Case Golf Corp has found uh, this beautiful kelp um, bag from Tasmania, which was Miss filed in the what's now the um Musée de Cabron Lee and it was put in under the African collection and uh she managed to identify because she kept she's great she goes in and she really sort of she's like the black sleuth you know going in and finding uh these things and then bringing them back so yeah but this very very old uh and there are two two of these bags so one is quite skinny and then there's this one here. So you can see if you look at this weave, um, I'm not replicating it, but sort of looking at the apertures, it's almost like a drawing in space of what it would be like. And it was really nice with Les McLeod this morning. He saw um, the, the large form as being almost like a shelter. And there's been plants that have been grown uh, within and around, which are very much about um, significant uh, plants used for healing. There is the kangaroo grass, of course, where the seeds are used to grind, be ground down for bread. There is the, the gaddy, uh, the xantheria. Uh, and in fact, he some, had some gaddy sticks, which he was using for making fire. Of course, the, the shaft of the gaddy was used for spears. Um, and then the gum uh, was used for many things as well, too, as a binder. So, yeah, it's not a, a literal uh, representation, but it's alluding to uh, this beautiful form. So another thing I'd, I'd uh, love it if you'd address, Judy, um, I'll just read a quote that we have from you. Mm -hmm. uh, Jugama is the name of net bag in the language of Gadigal people, of the Gadigal on whose land this artwork is located. The work is based on the typical dilly bag of the Sydney region made by female ancestors from the bark of various trees. It pays homage to the Aboriginal women who made the bags and wore them across their foreheads while collecting bush medicine and food, maintaining culture and caring for country. So I'm interested, Judy, in when we invited you to um, submit a concept for this uh, this particular site, which is a, a health building that's looking at integrated mm -hmm. medicine um, and, and general health. It's interesting for me, if you could tell us a little bit about how you connected this wonderful object and recreating that with health of country, of people. Mm. Well, I think uh, in terms of looking at uh, past ancestors, ancestral practice, it is like cultural retrieval. But it's also recognising innovation and wisdom and incredible, you know, scientific knowledge of, you know, which plants 
uh, were used for medicinal purposes, which ones could be used for healing, which ones could be used as sustenance for food. And it's looking at all of that. And of course, all across Australia and the world now, uh, you can see that there's such an emphasis on that, uh, you know, and there's been a lot of sharing and a lot of plundering of Aboriginal, um, you know, sort of knowledge as well. I mean, we've had many things and I've, all around the country, you know, there was the, the Gumby Gumby plant that um, some non-Aboriginal people were trying to, um, you know, take the name and establish that they were sort of, they owned the name Gumby Gumby, which is their healing plant from up there. And yet, uh, you know, if you go back through the records and also with the local communities, they've always used that name and the material itself, the plant, the leaves have been shared around with communities, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, um, you know, for a long, long time. So it's that sort of whole idea of um, a recognition and respect, but also, I guess, uh, it's my... Uh, matrilineal line of my family uh, that I sort of are Aboriginal and so I really want to honour them and also honour you know people um, of this place as well mm. and so it was very much also working with um, our community and also working with the idea of um, the plantings and what was the most appropriate uh, plantings and I don't know if you get a chance to see it but the plants are looking magnificent at the moment they're just looking so alive and beautiful. We are in La Nina, you know, season, luckily, but um, just flying into Sydney from Brisbane, it's so lush looking and, and gorgeous for now. I do like this too, this whole idea of, um, you can imagine, you know, sort of the old sort of idea of the spindle and, and uh, people pulling it together. And in this case, it was, um, you know, I think it was three guys winding it together. So it's almost like a sort of, um, you know, the modern take on, on a very old um, weaving tradition. And I've seen it in India and other places too. Yeah. Uh, while we're on this slide, I, I thought it might be interesting to talk about the, pro the design process. So mm. we've got your, your concept in terms of how the, the work um, related to the dilly bag and how it related to the, you know, health and plants. And then I'm interested to know, how the you envisage the actual artwork mm. um how much that changed through the process of design or did it not change and the constraints i suppose of the materials yes. but also the collaborative process of working with designers and uh, manufacturers and then also of course the landscape architects just interested in how that that is for you because you also have your own practice where you are very much it's a solo practice of printmaking and painting and so I'm just interested in how this different way of working with public art um how, how that sure goes for you well I remember first year sculpture uh, my welds were pretty bad so <laughs> I, I love working with somebody who's very good at welding uh and while I might be across uh, some, you know, features of fabrication. There's other times where for constructing something like this, while I like working with people, I like them to be sort of um, the best that I can work with. And that's in terms of designers, uh, you know, curators, fabricators, et cetera, et cetera. And also that they love the process as well. And you can really see that when people are working with it together and they get very excited so I wanted the idea of the basket to be sort of coming out of the ground. So it was um, a lot of talk about uh, how that was going to work. There was also the idea of this being something which allows light to spill through. So you get a sense of a living, breathing form and also with the plants sort of coming up through it and, and the lights at night, you know, to have almost that feeling of a glow, a celestial, you know, sort of... Uh, glow coming through this is a great shot seeing it come. Uh, but also the shadowing and you can see a little bit of shadowing you know as it as it comes uh across the grasses and things so have a have a look um to see at night and during the day there were many constraints uh even to do with the handle the handle had changed because i was imagining possibly a few inebriated um 
university students playing on, <laughs> hanging off the handle. I'm not. I'm sure you don't really have any, but you know, I, I remember when I was a student, <laughs> uh, and so it's you know various things. As I said, you know, it's the uh, making sure that you've got the appropriate sort of apertures, um, you know, which aren't going to be um, traps uh, for uh, children or adults, um, the sort of the actual form itself. Yeah, many, many things. And then I was also imagining because of the bicycles there, is anybody going to be, you know, sort of um, putting their bicycle up against it? But I don't think so. I think it'll be okay. Um. So my next question, has someone got the time? I don't seem to have the time up here. Okay, so I should probably almost wrap up soon. I'm not sure if we're going to get Jackie here. So maybe I'll just um, talk through what she, the insights that I got from her. Well, first, Jacqueline gave us the, the naming yeah. of the artwork, which was really very helpful. Um, I suppose in terms of, for, for me, and in terms of getting uh, familiar, familiarity with vocabulary, mm -hmm. um, and it was great to have her expertise. Um, it means net bag. Uh, did you have any understanding of that term in other languages, Judy, or, did, or was that? Uh, well, there, yeah, there are different names in other languages. And of course, I've, um, you know, greatly admired Jacqueline Troy's book and, uh, you know, and research of, um, you know, local Sydney languages. And if you go to 200 George Street to Narunga Nangam, you'll see where there's a, a listing of a lot of her language uh, carved into sandstone uh, as part of an understanding of, of the site and the history and the memory of place. But I did see that name, but I wasn't quite sure. So it was really fantastic to get it validated and also, I guess, within the community. And then also the validation of which plantings would be best um, at the site. And you really, this is early days and we no longer have the, the lilac uh, <laughs> covers there, but um, it's really sort of, it's like it's growing into itself and everything is growing around it. So it's lovely to see it after seeing everything online and, and also, yeah, hand, hand, uh, well, there's many things that have sort of changed. Seeing the building is amazing too. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes, it is. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Judy hasn't been down for about a year. We've worked out. So, um, mm. so it's all been done quite remotely, and uh, it's really, uh, in a in a in a sense, that was difficult. But also, in a sense, Judy's arrived now when the planting is actually looking really lush and oh. gorgeous, and it's it's really grown into it because it was installed, I think, in about. Oh, I'm trying to remember exactly when it was. Maybe it was November last year. So it's had all of summer growth mm. um, and the plants have really uh, come up and, and softened the, the form in a way mm. that you, um, you were really keen to have that happen. It's really important, I think, for the, the plants to be at the stage that they're at because suddenly it's not like a plonk. Mm. It's, uh, it's like something that's really deeply embedded and the plants are embracing the form. And I feel like... It's a, it, it has a, a lot of sense of nurturing, I think, to me. You know, it's a gathering mm. um, and uh, sheltering, and that's something that, um, you know, Les McLeod was saying as well. And there's, yeah, there's something very, very beautiful. It's like an embrace, you know, that you sort of feel of, of that place and also very respectful of, um, you know, <laughs> Aboriginal women and all their families who have been and always uh, will be here. Yeah, beautiful. And the smell today was amazing. And lovely, you know, that I have worked with his son and also with some of his elders um, out at Rec Bay. Mm. So I thought maybe we'd take this opportunity to, if there's any questions from the floor, um, and also from online, uh, if you can say the question, then I'll repeat it so that everyone in Zoom can actually hear it. Unless you want to come up and speak into the microphone. Do you want to come up? Do you, Peter, do you want to come up and speak into the microphone? Okay, please. Thank you, Judy. That was fantastic. Um, 
I'm Louise Hamby from ANU and fiber things are sort of my specialty. <laughs> so I, I've got a few more particular mm. questions mm. if you don't mind. Um, I know you mentioned the brachychitin early on. Is that the material for the original piece in the British Museum? Apparently, yeah, that was what was interesting. And I think that uh, this is what could, for any students out there or anybody who's got students, it would be great because that's what the wood scientist uh, took some of the material from the British Museum, analysed it and said it was a brachychitin illawarra flame tree. I was also wondering, because you were talking about a bit about the plants surrounding it, is there also a brachychitin megaphyllus planted near there? Uh, <laughs> yes, we went through that. <laughs> this is one of the, the um, topics that I really wanted to have a conversation with on Jack, with Jacqueline Troy, Professor Jacqueline Troy. So we've been, because we had information from the British Museum that the fibre, which was analysed by electron microscope, is that correct? Um, was of uh, Illawarra flame tree. And when I communicated this to, which is brachychitin, sorry, I've got it written down here somewhere. Someone mm. tell me who yep. knows what it's actually called. Um, brachychitin acerifolius is Illawarra flame tree. Jacqueline Troy, um, who's done weaving, her mother is a weaver, had said that actually she didn't think it would be that tree. She thought it was more likely the brachychitin, another one, which is the um, Currajong because it's a, a softer bark and more malleable. Um, so this is this is um, this is a question that it would be great to to re I suppose resolve <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I, so, I mean, we could continue the question about materials, but mm. I think one other interesting point uh, is the color that you ended up with. I assume is that core tin steel. Yeah. Yeah, because the colour is amazing because it really referenced the the string, mm. you know, the, the rocky that's actually that you get from uh, the bracky cut. Yes. Cord, yeah. Um, or, you know, and or the stringy bark. Yeah. Mm. So they're all mm. very name specifically. That's that right. Be great. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that's a good point. It's like the colour, the ochre, uh, the blood, um, the, the, yeah, the colour agent, you know, that you get from inside the inner bark of the tree, that dye, beautiful, yeah. Thank you, Louise. And now I'd like to, on that note, introduce oh. Professor Jacqueline Troy. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Jacqueline. Um, I've already introduced you to the floor. Would you like to come and join Judy? Um, Thank you. Hey, oh, Judy. <laughs> what Pleasure to meet you <laughs> to Sydney. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, well, hello, everybody. Warami, as we say in the language of Sydney, and um, of course, we're on Gadigal country. It's marvelous to be here um, and to have the chance to talk to you, Judy, about this remarkable sculpture that I think absolutely seems to the heritage of all our peoples, not only the Aboriginal people of Sydney, the Gadigal, particularly the clan from here. But as a woman, um, mm. it's such an important um, statement of our solidarity as Aboriginal women, I think. So Judy, um, I had the great opportunity to work with you um, in thinking about how to talk about this piece of work. And I'm really interested in um, language and your use of language. I know that in your own practice, one of the things that you have explored deeply is the use of archives and family histories and knowledge about self that we can find through the archives. And you've brought this kind of thinking into this wonderful piece outside our new Susan Wakel building and the, that whole environment actually um, screams Aboriginal Sydney. If anywhere it does on this campus, there's two little places that I think are very much about the Gadigal mob particularly, but all of us really. One is um, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Indigenous Lisa Jackson Pulver's yeah. garden. That's this marvellous little space where you can sit in the round on Sydney sandstone mm. uh, with trees, with plants, you know, one of your extreme focus, areas of focus. Um, and the colours are of the country, the plants are of the country. And as they grow up, they'll create the kind of shade that um, Aboriginal people love to be part of, of course. And um, 
that it will shade all of us and uh, you know it's a lovely place to sit and I think that this new precinct around the Susan Wakefield building does the same kind of thing it's a place for reflection for contemplation for thinking about our heritage and um, also our futures mm. um, and but it has this sort of marvelous resonance with the swamp and how it goes down to Black Wattle Bay yes. you know this sort of trickling stream and and you can imagine all these places along the way that Aboriginal people um, pre-1788, post-1788 and right up until now you've recreated this environment for us. So um, language and history, um, Judy, language and history. Absolutely and of course um, you know thank you so much for all the work you've done with language uh, around this region, incredible. I was first aware of it from the Museum of uh, Sydney and of course in the Narunga Nangama uh, you know, project, you know, working with your rich resources of uh, language and materials and things like that. It's an amazing gift. And in fact, Les McLeod was saying he needs to catch up with you. Oh, sister. that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's <good. laughs> yeah. I like this. Even here, it's like, oh, by the way, we have some news on the Black Telegraph. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> telegraph, telephone, yeah. telecurry, <laughs> or a Murray. That's right. <laughs> so, um, yes, well, um, and the, the remarkable and wonderful thing is that the language in Sydney is now very actively used by mm. its community. Um, We've been very fortunate to have advice from two young Gadigal men, Joel and Cameron Davison, yes. who are both horticulturalists as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they um, bring a kind of sensibility about country. This is something I'm thinking more and more about. That's, this is you, isn't it, Judy? Sensibility about country. Is that, um, <laughs> and you. <laughs> uh, well, but I think, and I think it, that's something that, marks us very much as Indigenous people, doesn't mm. it? What do, you, mm. what do you think, Judy, about Yeah, I think it's, uh, it, it, it's sensitivity. Of course, it's very different if you are going into the country of your ancestors. That's incredibly mm. strong. Mm. But even going into other Aboriginal language, Mm -hmm. feeling that that presence and sort of yeah. knowing trying to approach it in the right way but I was thinking I, I did work with Joel Davidson from the Art Gallery of New South Wales we did a sort of a sound tour mm -hmm. and so speaking names of you know Gadigal names and people had headphones and I mm -hmm. uh, worked with UAP to shape shells so the idea of listening mm. to shells you know sort of sound and then as we walked along through the CBD and through the Botanic Gardens, we were saying the names and repeating them after Joel Davidson said them. And it was so powerful. It's, a, it's saying, saying language so the country knows you. And the naming of your sculptures, of course, um, what drives you and motivates you with, you know, bringing language into it? It's the same sort of mm. thing, isn't it? To, it is. And you thank you for that. Well, if you speak the name of something, then you are invoking it. This museum has a, a wonderful focus on um, its Egyptian collection. Of course, we've got a, at Sydney University a wonderful classics collection, and I've been the beneficiary as a young student. I was studying archaeology, classical archaeology at Sydney University. But we have these um, Egyptian, um, their funeral uh, objects, of course, people's sarcophagi, and indeed we've got um, mummified bodies as well but one of the things about those um, objects is that if you, they say on them if you speak my name then I am not dead yeah and this is something I think that pervades a lot of indigenous cultures this is yes. one of the reasons why I think using language is so important you know mm -hmm. to call these things by their name this beautiful yeah. knotless it's, knitting bag oh it's here. amazing 1790 I know, so, incredible. You know, these are, um, yeah. if you know these objects and you speak their name, so with all your sculptures, you speak the name. Mm. Well, it's always uh, you need to work with somebody to find out, you know, being from another language group mm. and trying to, to, to do it as respectfully as you can so that you are honouring uh, the people, you know, from this place. But that idea of language on country, you know, is really 
an important one mm. um, to use the language of country. And it's a wonderful thing here in Sydney now, the way the different clan groups are calling themselves by their own names. So there are more than, I think there's something like 27 or more now. Wow. Um, I keep losing track because every day there's another, oh, this is great, you know, another group is identifying. And, you know, there's the usual sort of um, tentative understanding and stronger understandings and, and um, to have um, public artworks that engage with this understanding of people on country that this is Gadigal clan area, mm. for example, is so important. Wouldn't um, it be great to have sort of, you know, like signs. I mean, there are more yeah. and more across the country saying you are on and whichever land yeah. it is, but to have it through the CBD as well yeah. would be wonderful. Everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I work with a wonderful man from Multan in Pakistan, and he's Indigenous Saraiki. And he said as a migrant coming to Australia, he was used to um, multilingual um, signage mm. and um, in Pakistan and, of course, multilingual messages. And he was surprised at the monolinguality that, you know, so you get on trains and you, you know, here next stop is Auburn's where he's from now, but, you know, and the next station is Stratfield, you know, it goes on. Um, and he said, wouldn't it be wonderful is if as you go through each station, you're moving into the country of this um, oh. particular group. So we've been trying to pitch that to... Um, Transport is as well, so I'm I'm using this as a sneak. But you started no, I, no, no, no. And wouldn't it be great <laughs> to, to hear? Um, yeah. And at this stage, the seasonal factor you are seeing out there oh, is yes. talking about the coming of the whales, or the this yeah, or the that. Yeah, yeah. The artist sensibility, not just the indigenous <laughs> sensibility. So yeah, so um, yeah, so make make these places, and all across Australia, we could oh, yeah. be doing this. Um, of course, we have been dual naming. Um, in the Sydney area, particularly around the harbour, there's mm. about, I think, 12 or 14 places with dual names and um, the Aboriginal community in Sydney. I can remember being at a consultative meeting where a whole lot of people who, who typically, you know, clans have their standoffishness, you know, said to me, well, I wouldn't normally sit discussing these things with these people. <laughs> Uh, but for the purposes of this, we are coming together because language and naming and understanding place through our naming mm. is so critically important. Absolutely. So. Uh, for the national, I'll give you a little sneak peek of what you're going to see in um, my work as you go down the escalators. You'll see clouds of oh. one year language, but then you'll also hear sound and the sound will be of our one year country, right. running water country, but also the sound of the subterranean um, tank stream in underneath. So oh. that's like a hovering and it's called clouds and undercurrents. So oh, I, I I'm sort of coming around more and more to language too. Mm. And my mm. mother has written some of the language, my son, my sister and I, and it's just, it's lovely to be immersed in language and also mm. country. So thank you. Well, look, language is, um, you know, the idea of separating um, language use, whether it's spoken or written. Um, I love the work of Imant Stillers, for example, where he um, uses text and images of country. And I was just talking to our own Janelle Evans from oh, Sydney yeah, College of yeah, the yeah. Arts here, who's just finishing her PhD, everybody. Oh. I can see Stephen Gilchrist smiling at me. He's another one across the line. So another Aboriginal PhD in visual arts. So um, you know, she was talking about, we were talking about these, um, this use of, of language and script and words um, and, um, and then the sound of them and in, in her work. And, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, language is, is, is an art form in itself, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. In every way. So, mm. yeah. yeah, I think it hovers and also sound goes into you. So you can, you know, go like this, but unless you go like this, yes. sometimes it's just like this osmosis and it's sort of like you you have swallowed mm. that, you take that on, and then you'll always hear it again. A lot of people talk about um, dreaming about their language mm. and sort of um, learning their language that comes to them in their sleep memories. It's really interesting. Uh, there is a field of anthropology that says there's a thing called echo memory. And it's hmm. this idea that there's a sort of biological memory that we're born with, a cultural memory. 
Um, and I, you know, when I look at the work of someone like yourself, Judy, and your progression through the archives and into this sort of bolder, you know, I am um, kind of world of um, expressing your your own sensibilities around your language, your culture, your people, and engaging with other communities across Australia and in this respectful way of on country, I respect what's of this country. You know, I think about, um, again, this sensibility, maybe there is something um, that is programmed into Indigenous communities that is more recent. I mean, one way or another, we're all Indigenous, aren't we? There's some, some everybody's Indigenous to somewhere at some point in their human history. Mm. Um, and I um, think it's, it's a, it, what's really marvelous working for me, working at a place like the University of Sydney is that I have the chance to explore the scholarship of people who identify as non-Indigenous, mm. which is quite a, there are quite a lot of people who do, um, as well as Indigenous scholars. Um, but it also makes me think about these meeting points. And as you say, everybody has, a sense of connection to place and country. If they allow themselves to feel it. But I also think, wouldn't it be great if we all started speaking the language of, you know, this place? Because a lot of people <laughs> say that when you speak the language of place, yeah. it's like, it, you know, the land around wakes up yeah. and it knows. I it's like, oh, that. I speak your name. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, that would be good. Yeah, and I love the idea of the trains. Yeah, and buses. Yeah. You should do that. Transport Australia, everyone. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, these are the things that sometimes they take many elements, don't they? They mm. take government to get involved and mm. community approval and engagement and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay. Oh, oh, it now's a good time really? to take any more questions <laughs> from the floor, from Jenny or Jackie. Yes, would you mm. like to? Um, ask your question, then I can repeat it so that the everyone at home can hear it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, so just to repeat the question was, how did it feel transferring uh, the soft material of the bag through to a, um, a hard steel material? Does that summarise sufficiently? Okay, Judy. Uh, well, there have been occasions where the transfer of uh, the woven object has been done in a different way. Uh, there's a work you can look at online, Tyro, outside the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. And in that case, it was using the actual a soft material which was then cast in bronze and had a very, very different look. In this case here, it was a very different way of almost using uh, the idea of a drawing in space and the light and the shadow of it and something else which is fairly robust but has a feeling of delicacy, almost like something, you know, it's been pierced. Mm. So it's, it's tricky. Uh, but satisfying to see it here. And it feels instantly yes, yes. recognisable as a Basque, you know, it has that as a woven piece, mm. even though it is metal. And maybe the rusted patina too, mm. you know, that mm. creates that sense of um, delicacy about it as well, I think. Yeah, and Louise was just talking about that before, I think, as you came in, about the way that the colour actually takes on. It's almost like the dye that you mm. get from... Uh, the fibre itself, it's yes. the, but I thought it's all, also connected to, to blood and ochre yes. and uh, the body. Yes, yes. Mm. Uh, just a comment to, like, more like a footnote, that Judy's work that was um, launched today is in fact the third of three wonderful public art commissions, all by Indigenous artists. And if you haven't seen them, the first we uh, launched about three years ago by Robert Andrew. Mm. And in fact, Jackie worked <laughs> with Robert on Carabara language, yeah, yeah. which was absolutely cool to his work. It's a, a lovely piece, um, again, with that kind of rusted, eroded look about it, um, Garabara. And uh, we now have a Sydney Knowledge Feast 
for our Indigenous research uh, that is, um, take, brings the idea of performative practice and doing research as performance, um, which is something that Indigenous researchers talk mm. about. And we call it, call it Garabarala, which is literally let's corroboree, let's dance and sing and the la is let's do that. So He's got a beautiful yeah. um, show at the moment at Milani Gallery in Brisbane, which you can probably see online. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So if you have a look at his work, it's once again that residue performance uh, erosion Amazing, amazing mm. artist. We had Anne-Marie that was, was uh, Milani Gallery in Brisbane. On Eastern Avenue. Yes. So on a so three-part walk spine. Mm. So go from the street, first part, which is in the environmental sciences foyer, mm. and then the other two works are mural mm. and the two sandstone blocks walking mm. down Eastern Avenue. Mm. So we're extraordinarily uh, privileged to mm. have such major Indigenous artworks mm. by some of our best Indigenous artists. Best artists. Thank you. Uh, so before we, we're really nearly out of time. Do we have any other questions for our guests? What, maybe last question, yes? Mm. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It resonates with a lot of Indigenous work in Australia forever um, that was not meant to be permanent. Um, yeah. You know, some things people made to keep, like the slabs when you were making a, um, a bark house and you'd paint on the inside of those things and they would be kept for a longer period of time. But things like the Pukamani poles that are grave markers, they degrade and um, corroboree grounds um, indeed, and, you know, degrade and marks on, marks on trees to guide people through hunting grounds and things were meant to be more permanent. But there's this sort of, it's nice, the sort of permanent impermanence about that work. Mm. That's a really, yeah. 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 That comment from the floor is that it, it the rust, the rusted steel um, has the sense that it's been uncovered from mm. the earth. And that's what I want. I wanted it to sort of look like it's coming out. So, oh. yeah, nice. Uh, that's I, like a renewal too mm, of our cultural mm, practices. It's mm, lovely. Yeah. Mm. I think there was one final question before we wrap up. Mm. 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 So that, uh, yes, yeah, that that comment from the floor was that it's mm. very open. It looks like it's just been used and had items put in it and has been placed down on the ground. Mm. It's lovely, isn't it? Like some Aboriginal woman from Sydney, maybe Bajagarong, the great language woman, yeah. um, came past and just left it there for us to see. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe yeah. it's just pushed itself out. That's right. It's come yeah. Yeah. Okay. On that note, I'm going to um, uh, say thank you to both my speakers for your time and. Um, for your insight. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to also thank all of those who have contributed to, to this project. It's been an absolute pleasure working with Judy and with Milani Gallery. Urban art projects have been fantastic partners all the way through design, construction and installation. Arcadia Landscape Architecture designed the wonderful planting for this artwork that's so integral to its concept and uh, indeed to the surrounds of the Susan Wakel Health Building. Mm. 
We appreciate the contribution of Indigenous landscape strategist Kaylee Salvatore from Arcadia and also Josh Ma of the Metropolitan Aboriginal Land Council in consultation about the planting. I would also like to thank here the University of Sydney's Art in the Public Realm Advisory Panel for their counsel. Many other individuals and organisations, too many to name here, have been involved in this project. And uh, finally, once again, I'd like to sincerely thank my guests, Judy Watson and Jacqueline Troy, for their time and knowledge. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> I know.